Today on America's Test Kitchen, Richard and Julia make authentic Tuscan-style roast pork. Adam shows Julia his favorite wine accessories. And Becky shows Bridget the secrets to the best farro salad with asparagus, sugar snap peas, and tomatoes. It's all coming up on America's Test Kitchen. Today, we're going to introduce you to a brand new roast pork dish called arista, which is derived from the Greek word aristos, meaning the best. And in this case, best means a flavorful pork roast with a deeply brown crust and plenty of rosemary and garlic flavor in every single bite. The most interesting thing about our recipe is that it starts with the lowly <laughs> boneless center cut pork loin. But today, we're going to show you how to transform this inexpensive everyday cut of meat into a masterpiece with lots of flavor, and it all starts with garlic. And here's what we're using, eight cloves of garlic. Whoa! It's quite a bit. We want it inside the meat, on the outside of the meat, and we don't want it to have that raw, harsh mm -hmm. garlic flavor. So we're gonna cook this. We're gonna cook it in a little bit of oil, and we'll get two different components for our dish to use later on. Now, in a skillet here, 10-inch skillet, I have a third cup of extra virgin olive oil. Go ahead and place this right in. The and olive this oil. pan's cold. That's right, pan's cold. Olive oil's cold. I'm a little cold. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to start it in a cold pan, cook all this together so that the garlic can spend the maximum amount of time in that oil without burning. Now, I also have a quarter teaspoon of red pepper flakes. Mm, a kick. And it wouldn't be a great dish without lemon, right? <laughs> garlic, lemon, a little rosemary later on, great flavors. Now, we want to use a little bit of this zest in this oil and garlic mixture. And rasp is the best tool for the job. So I just need about a teaspoon of grated lemon zest. Always a good idea to only get the outside of the lemon or lime, anything you're zesting. You don't want to get to the white part. That's where all the bitterness lives. And that is about a teaspoon there. So now I'm going to heat this on medium low, give it a stir here. And we'll cook this until the garlic starts to sizzle. And that's only going to take about three minutes. But I do mm. want to keep an eye on it. I don't want it to burn. All right. So cooking the garlic here before putting it with the pork roast is important because garlic, when it's first cut, has a very harsh tasting compound called allicin. But that allicin breaks down into much milder tasting compounds after it's been heated to 140 degrees, which we're doing here on the skillet, not later in the oven. That smells so good. <laughs> That's right. That little bit of lemon zest has those oils in there. It really blooms in that olive oil. All right. So now we're going to finish this up. It's a tablespoon of freshly minced rosemary. Do not use the dried stuff here. And about 30 seconds in the pan. That's all it's going to take. Ooh, that smells good. <laughs> exactly. It goes quickly. So we're done with the stove at this point. Now I'm going to pour this through a fine mesh strainer over a bowl. Get all that out as much as I can. Take a rubber spatula here. I want to press out as much of that oil as I possibly can because we're going to use that oil later on. Now we're just going to leave this here to cool off for a couple of minutes. In the meantime, let's move over to the food processor. I mean, pork loin doesn't really have that deep savory mm -hmm. flavor, but what does is pancetta. Oh, nice. Exactly. So adding a little pork to the pork. We're adding pork to the pork. So this is two ounces of pancetta. Cut it up into small pieces here. So I'll process this for about 30 seconds. I may need to scrape down the sides a couple of times, but what I'm looking for is that pancetta to form a nice smooth paste. It's like pancetta pate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll go ahead and place this lemon garlic mixture right in there. Ooh. Oh yeah. That's going to be a paste with some serious flavor. <laughs> you got it. And now about another 30 seconds until it's all nice and smooth. That looks pretty good. You can see it's a great smooth texture there. So we need to figure out a way to get it inside of this two and a half pound center cut pork loin. And it doesn't have a lot of flavor because it is a pork loin cut from the leanest area of the loin. So not only do we need to get that flavor in, but we want to make sure that this cut stays nice and juicy. I'm going to start off with my chef's knife. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start cutting this pork about an inch up from the board and opening this up as I go. Now that I've made that first couple cuts, I'm going to move over to my boning knife. And I'm just making a series of cuts again, opening this up. And what I'm doing is I open it up, so I'm trying to check to make sure that I'm getting it even. And I want to stop before I reach the other end, this side of the pork roast. All right, let's see. 
Again, I am not cutting all the way through. So you can see this side is much thicker than this one. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to start cutting again. Same thing, just basically creating a nice even surface. And again, I want to stop before I reach all the way through. So by doing this, you're essentially tripling the surface area of the pork. Exactly. And that means more seasoning and more of that pancetta paste. Mm. This is still a little bit lumpy, but it's an easy fix. Put a little piece of plastic wrap on top. Grab a meat pounder and give it a few pounds. Now that looks pretty even. Yeah, not too bad. Now, before we put on that flavor paste, I'm going to load this up with quite a bit of salt. It's a tablespoon of kosher salt. We're going to apply this to both sides. And this is one of the great reasons for opening up pork loin and seasoning it right on the inside. I should also mention here that we wanted to buy a pork loin with the fat cap still attached. This is the fat cap. Mm -hmm. We want as much of that fat to flavor the pork as we can get. So now, I'll go ahead and start applying our flavorful paste here. Using an offset spatula, you could use a rubber spatula for this, but I want to apply it in an even layer. Again, it's really concentrated mm. with those great flavors. And I'll avoid about the quarter inch edge around here. All right, that looks pretty good. We're gonna roll it back up, jelly roll style. Oh, so you're not gonna just fold it back the way you unfolded it. You're gonna roll it into a nice round roulade. Exactly. Mm. So now we need to tie this up to keep it in this nice cylindrical shape. And much like Bridget's doing here, when you tie a roast, I like to put the twine under the roast before tying it. That way you can make sure the pieces of twine are evenly spaced throughout the length of the meat. All right, so we'll go ahead and tie this up. I'll do a double loop here. Just makes it a little bit easier for that string to stay as is. And then a double knot. I do that when I'm wrapping presents too. You know what, it took me about 18 Christmases to figure that one out. <laughs> Now, I'll go ahead and start snipping these. I want to leave a little bit of a string on there, because if you cut it too short, it can start to unravel. I've done that. <laughs> so that is it on prep for the roast. I'm going to move it over here. I've got a rack set over a rimmed baking sheet, and we've gone ahead and sprayed both of these with a little bit of cooking spray. This is going to go into the refrigerator for about an hour. We want that salt to work into the meat and help that pork to retain its juices as it cooks. All right, the roast is out of the fridge and ready for the oven. We're not going to start it on the stove top and brown it. Yeah, I was going to say, what's <laughs> going on here? What we want to do is retain as much of the natural juices that are in that pork. We don't want it to be forced out with super high heat, especially at the beginning. So we're going to put it in a low oven, 275 degrees, for about one and a half to two hours to an internal temperature of 135 degrees. All right, Julia, I wanted to give you a peek at what's coming. You know, I wondered what was under there. <laughs> Beautiful oh. pork loin. So mm -hmm. I took it out, tinted it with foil. It's been resting for about 20 minutes. All right, let's move over here. I've got all this fragrance going I on. I know, it's like lemon and garlic. Is this that oil that you drained off at the beginning? Exactly. So this is a teaspoon of that flavorful garlic oil, heating it over high heat until we just start to see a little bit of smoke. So you remember the lemon that I zested earlier. Mm -hmm. I went ahead and cut it in half. I'm gonna place the lemons cut side down right in that skillet. It's only going to take a few minutes, maybe three, four minutes, but what that is doing is caramelizing some of that lemon. It's going to really tone down the harshness of the lemon. Later on, we'll squeeze out deeply flavored lemon juice. All right, take a look at these lemons. Ooh, that's gorgeous. <laughs> I'll take these out of the pan, put them on a plate just so they can cool down for a moment. And now we're going to start browning that roast. So I'll take two tablespoons of the garlic oil. We're going to let this go until it starts smoking. So back to the roast. Even though we dried this off in the oven, as it's been sitting here, a little bit of the moisture has eked back to the surface. And we can't have that, so just a quick pat down. All right, and we want to get this really good and smoking. I see some smoke here, so we're going to put it right into the pan. So this is only going to take about four to six minutes. Now I'm going to brown it on that fat cap side and then on the two other sides, but not on this bottom point because we don't want this pork roast to stay in the pan too long. Remember, it came up to 135 right out of the oven, so it's pretty much done. We just are getting color at this point. All right, Julia, brown on all sides but the bottom. Look oh at that. Oh my gosh, that's gorgeous. <laughs> so this is going to come out of the pan, and we'll just give it a quick snip. Get rid of that twine. I always like to go in a seam. And so you don't need to rest it at this point because it already rested when it came out of the oven. That's exactly right. That is a good looking pork roast. So, so beautiful. I'm 
going to make a last minute vinaigrette using the rest of that oil. And this is where those sauteed lemons come into play. They should be cool enough to handle. Squeeze them right over a fine mesh strainer into a small bowl. I need about two tablespoons here. One, two. So this mm. is going to give that caramelized sweet lemon flavor. So that oil has the garlic, rosemary, and lemon zest. And to that, you just added that caramelized lemon juice. That's right. And that is as easy as that. Mm. So if you wouldn't mind putting this over there, we're gonna serve that with the pork. And in the meantime, I can go ahead and slice this into quarter inch slices. Mm. Check that out. That is cool. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, I love seeing that little pinwheel, knowing that that's pancetta in there. <laughs> it's a pork pinwheel of pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> How many would you like there, dear? Oh, give me one good center cut. Maybe one more. Just okay. two? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> May I drizzle them with some of your vinaigrette? I would love that. Thank you. Hard to believe that this was just a lowly center cut pork loin when we started. I know. Because this looks nothing like that piece of meat. Mmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the pork is juicy. It's not overcooked and rubbery. And I like that little vinaigrette at the end. I just love when you get to the center, it's like jackpot. <laughs> <laughs> Great job, Bridget. Thank you. I love that trick with the pancetta paste. It really gave this pork a new lease on life. So to make an arista pork loin, start by taming the garlic's harsh flavor by cooking it in oil on the stovetop, along with some lemon zest, pepper flakes, and rosemary. Then process that garlic mixture and some pancetta into a paste and roll it inside the butterfly pork loin. Finally, roast the pork loin in a low oven before giving it a good sear in a hot skillet and serve it with a fresh lemon vinaigrette. So there you have it. From the test kitchen to your kitchen, a terrific recipe for Tuscan-style pork roast with garlic and rosemary. In the world of wine gadgets, there's only one that I think you need, and that's a corkscrew. But Adam's here with us today to show us two others that he thinks are worth the money. I would be a fool to argue that a corkscrew <laughs> is absolutely the most important thing. But if you're like me, when you travel, mm -hmm. you end up bringing home bottles of wine, bottles of olive oil, all kinds of heavy bottles. And that's why I consider myself to be something of an expert when it comes to cushioning bottles in laundry <laughs> and wedging them into a suitcase yep. and hoping for the best. I've done that. <laughs> sometimes it works out well, sometimes it works out wet, unfortunately. Using a wine travel bag that is designed for the purpose might be a better thing to do. <laughs> we have four of them here, the price range, was a lot. <laughs> what are you going scuba diving with this thing? <laughs> it's part wetsuit, part wine travel bag. So we had this lineup of four wine travel bags. The price range was $5 at a low to $28 at a high. One of them, as you can see, was made from big soft cushion neoprene. Three mm -hmm. of them were plastic with some sort of cushioning. What testers did is load them up with bottles of wine and they did three different abuse tests. They <laughs> dropped them from waist height. They packed them into suitcases and tossed them around like an angry baggage <laughs> handler. <laughs> and they rolled them down flights of stairs. Oh, that's awesome. Three of these bags, epic fails. We won't even talk about those. Really? One of them, this guy right here, did a really good job up until the last bottle. This is the $28 Vinny bag. It's designed like a sailor's dry bag. Mm -hmm. It's thick plastic. It's inflatable. It's about the size of a loaf of bread, mm -hmm. and it protected the bottle, kept them all intact until the very last drop. The bottle broke in the last drop, but because it's sealed, none of the liquid got out. Oh, so that's I consider good. that a success. So this is the $28 Vinny bag for traveling with <laughs> wine. Let's move down to these gizmos here. These are champagne savers. Because mm -hmm. what happens if you don't get through a whole bottle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, there must be people who need to save the rest of their bottle. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to have you taste from every single one of these bottles because we would be on the floor, but I will tell you that we had a lineup of six of these champagne savers. The price range was a low of $4.44 for that one. I know this one. To a high of $35, ah, if you can believe that. I also that. know this one. <laughs> <laughs> this is the ATK Special Method uh -huh. plastic wrap and a rubber band. The rubber band's getting fancy. I'll tell you how we tested these. We poured a glass and a half of champagne out of the bottle. We used the sealer on them. We refrigerated it. And every day we tasted the saved champagne against a bottle that had just been left open on the counter, against one that had been opened freshly, and 
against the ATK <laughs> patented <laughs> plastic wrap and rubber band method. My and kind of tasting, by the way. I will tell you, I actually want you to do a little champagne Ooh. tasting. Come with me. We have Don't two have glasses to twist for my you. Arm. See if you can tell the difference between the one that was just opened and the one that we saved for two days. Well, I can see different in the bubbles. There's more bubbles in this one than there are in this one. You have a sharp eye, Julia. Mm. Did I mention I used to work in a champagne house? I should have remembered that I was dealing with an expert here. Mm. It's pretty clear to me that this one was freshly open and this one's been sitting for a day or two. You are an expert, but you know, I've actually thought that was not It's bad really shit. good. There's still some bubbles and body in there. Exactly, and that one was saved with this guy here. This is the Cilio Champagne Bottle Saver. Cilio. It was $7.50. And I'll tell you, it was one tiny little thing that made it work so well. When you put it onto the bottle and seal it correctly, it makes a little tiny click so that you know it's affixed uh -huh. and the bottle is sealed. It was the only one of these that did that. So it was easy to put on and it gave you a little audible affirmation. So if you can't seem to finish your bottle of champagne, pick up one of these. A Cilio Champagne Bottle Sealer at about $7.50. And if you like to travel a lot and bring back bottles of wine or good olive oil, consider picking up a Vinny bag at about 28 bucks. When I was growing up, I loved a big bowl of mashed potatoes or pasta, but my favorite was a bowl of buttered rice. So good. Now these days, I see another grain at the market, and that is farro. Farro is an ancient form of wheat with mild wheat flavor and a tender texture. That all sounds great, but I'm here with Becky to find out just how on earth farro can ever compete with rice. Oh, it can totally compete <laughs> with rice. It'll actually win. Yeah, you think so? <laughs> all right, gauntlet <laughs> thrown, right? That's right. <laughs> Nutritionally, farro has a lot going for it. It has about the same amount of calories as brown or white rice, but it has twice as much fiber as brown rice, and it's also got twice as much protein as either brown or white oh, rice. Oh, okay. So let's start to cook the farro. I have one and a half cups of rinsed whole grain farro here. And when you're shopping for farro at the supermarket, you want to take a look at the back of the bag and make sure that it just says farro. You don't want the quick cooking stuff. Okay. You also don't want to follow the instructions on the back of the bag. And we didn't like the way the farro turned out, so we came up with a better method. Oh, sounds great. I have two quarts of boiling water here. I'm adding a tablespoon of salt and the one and a half cups of farro. And we'll let this come back up to a boil. And then we'll turn it down to a simmer. We'll let it cook for 15 to 20 minutes until the farro is nice and tender with just a little bit of chew. That sounds great. And you're not looking for the farro to absorb all this water. This is more the pasta cooking method, right? That's right, where we can drain off all the water at the end. It's much more foolproof. You can't really mess it up. So it's been about 20 minutes. Our farro is nice and tender with just a little bit of chew left. So if you do me a favor and strain that off. Sure, happy please. to. Thank you. So there's our perfectly cooked farro. We could just add a little butter or olive oil, some salt and pepper, make it a nice side dish. You could add it to a soup, but we're gonna turn it into a salad. I've got asparagus, some sugar snap peas, and cherry tomatoes. I have six ounces of each. The usual way to prep asparagus is to take it like this and let it snap, right? Wherever right. it naturally breaks. The weak spot, right? Yeah, right, right there. <laughs> we recently found out that you don't need to do that. You can actually save a little bit of the asparagus by cutting it off at about the one inch mark. So I'm just gonna get my ruler out here. So you end up cutting off a little bit less. That's great. That means you get a little bit less waste. So we'll just cut these into one inch pieces. I've got some water boiling on the stove here. I'm adding a tablespoon of salt. In goes the asparagus, that's six ounces. Six ounces of our sugar snaps. And we'll let these go for just two or three minutes. We just wanna maintain their color and their crispness. So I'm going to make a nice lemony vinaigrette that'll really contrast nicely with the earthy farro and the vegetables. Well, I already have three tablespoons of extra virgin olive oil. I'm adding two tablespoons of fresh lemon juice, two tablespoons of minced shallot, a teaspoon of Dijon mustard, a quarter teaspoon of salt, and a quarter teaspoon of pepper. Easy. We're doing it in the time it takes to blanch those veggies, right? Give that a whisk, and that is done. So it's been about two minutes. I'm gonna take the veggies out. And I'm airing on the side of underdone here. They're gonna continue to cook a little bit as I take them out of the pot. So I'll just spread these out so they can cool down. We'll let them cool for about 15 minutes and then we'll come back and assemble our salad. So it's been 15 minutes. Everything is nice and cooled down, including me. <laughs> <laughs> You're always hot. <laughs> so let's put the salad together. Here's those veggies that we blanched. 
Still beautifully green. Yep. And I can feel them, they're nice and crisp. Okay, now I have six ounces of cherry tomatoes. This is a half a cup of feta. I'm gonna add half of it to the salad and I'll save a quarter cup of it to garnish. Okay. And now I have three tablespoons of fresh dill. So good, it really brightens up mm -hmm. the whole salad. And our vinaigrette that we made earlier. Oh, that smells good already. I know. Oh, got that dill hint. Mm. So I'll just toss that together. That is one good looking salad That's already. Gorgeous. I can't wait. All right, can I serve you? Please. That is beautiful. Don't forget a little bit of feta on top. All right. There you go. Thank you. I just want to tuck into just the farro here, just to compare it to rice. I know it's going to win. What's great about it, it has that almost a toasty flavor to it, like yeah. toasted meat. A little meat. bit earthy, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Nice chew, too. Mm -hmm. I love the bright lemony vinaigrette. It's a really nice contrast with that earthy farro. Mm -hmm. And the veggies are cooked just right. They still have a nice little bit of crispness. This is superb, excellent. Thanks so much, Becky. You're welcome. Move over, rice. I love the fluffy texture and weedy flavor of farro. And it's perfect to use in a farro salad with asparagus, sugar snap peas, and cherry tomatoes. Start by boiling whole grain farro with water for foolproof, fluffy, separate grains. Drain the farro, then blanch asparagus and snap peas to ensure that they stay crisp, tender. Make an easy lemon vinaigrette, then assemble the salad with tomatoes, dill, and feta. And there you have it, from our test kitchen to your kitchen, an incredible farro salad with asparagus, sugar snap peas, and tomatoes. And you can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings, testings, and selected episodes on our website, americastestkitchen.com. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later. <laughs>